relevance of Buddha's teachings in today's education. And my background is that I'm a professor at uh, Taylor's University, where I teach tourism economics, and I had been a president of the Buddhist Gem Fellowship. I was one of the founding members, and I've been president for many years now. And uh, part of my role in the Buddhist community is I was one of the composers of, of Buddhist music as well, so I'm a musician. Uh, so we talk about the relevance of Buddhist teachings in today's education. Um, well, maybe let's go back to the meaning of education. Uh, uh, education is imparting or acquiring general knowledge or skills and developing the power of reasoning and judgment and preparing oneself or others intellectually for mature life. So in another words, education is to develop knowledge, skill, and character. Uh, so these are something really uh, important. Um, now, um, the other definition uh, is from Bill BT. The aim of education should be to teach us rather how to think than to what to think rather to improve our mind so as to enable us to think for ourselves than to load the memory with thoughts of other men. So this is really uh, in a process of education, we should encourage uh, students uh, to uh, learn by themselves to, um, to, uh, in order to uh, discover for themselves. Uh, it's not so much as giving package information. Uh, and uh, part of it is also to improve the minds so that uh, the students are able to think for themselves rather than just filling up themselves with the thoughts of other people. Okay. Now, when we look at this, I think an important sutra for the Buddhist is, let me minimize that, yes. The Buddha has actually taught what we call the Kalama Sutta to the villages from uh, Kesaputta. Uh, I guess Kesaputta must have been uh, very busy during that time. Many teachers from uh, various traditions will pass through Kesaputta and every one of them will extol the, the strength of their teachings and tend to degrade the teachings of others. So when the Buddha came to Kesaputta, the um, devotees came to him and said, you know, uh, teacher, master, uh, Bhagavan. Uh, the problem is that we do not really know what to accept because there are so many teachings that have been teacher, taught by each of the gurus that have passed through. So instead of giving them a set of things to remember and think and to believe. The Buddha started off by saying, yes, Kalamas, it is proper that you have doubt, that you have perplexity, for doubt has arisen in a matter that is doubtful. So in a sense, the Buddha encouraged that maybe the starting point of getting knowledge is for you to have some kind of doubt. So for you to have a question, like when you begin your PhD uh, dissertation or thesis, you begin with what we call the research question. You have to ask a question. And the Buddha said, now, do not be led by reports or traditions or hearsay. Do not be led by the authority of religious texts, nor by mere logic or inference, nor by considering appearances, not by delight in speculative opinions, not by seeming possibilities, not by the idea, this is our teacher. So these are really nine things that the Buddha says, okay, just don't dive in and just blindly believe uh, the things that you hear from either reports or because it is part of the tradition that we have followed or hearsay, you know, things that have been reported in the press sometimes all the uh, controversies and the uh, conspiracy theories. Just don't believe that. And uh, don't believe by the authority of religious text, just because it is found in the religious books, uh, that you just uh, believe that. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, we need to check, not by logic of inferences, or just by seeing appearances, you know, uh, or in delight in something that is speculative or or just by thinking, oh, maybe it is possible, or even the fact that a person is our teacher. Now, very often when the Kalama Sutta is quoted, these nine things of not what to believe has been uh, printed and distributed. But actually, if you look in the Kalama Sutta, an uh, important fact is what follows after that. Uh, and the Buddha has actually given a criteria of how we go about choosing what to believe and what not to believe. The Buddha said by Kalamas, when you yourself know what is bad, 
blameworthy and censured by the wise. Abandon those things. So you need to see, are these things good or bad? Are they blameworthy? Are they things that will be encouraged by the wise? When you yourself know that these things are good, not blameworthy, but praised by the wise, accept and practice them. Uh, so this comes from the Samyutta Nikaya Sutta number eight. So this, the Buddha has actually given a, a criteria on how people can think freely for themselves. Uh, so education is really search and self-discovery. Uh, the previous way of teaching is to give packaged information in textbooks and bundled opinions. And as we know in the field of education, after the textbooks have been printed, very often they go out of date. And uh, even opinions, even scientific opinions keep changing, right? Like what we're experiencing from COVID-19, uh, WHO comes back with uh, different sets of things, you know, as they begin to discover uh, true research. Uh, new things about COVID-19. So the exam halls in the past was where students used to reproduce what they remember. So if you've got a good memory, you tend to do very well in your exams. Uh, let us return back to the meaning of education. That is to develop knowledge, to develop a skill and character. So education is no longer the provision of ready solutions, but to encourage the students to search and discover for themselves. And these days, uh, we uh, are very fortunate because we have the Google and uh, other search engine, but of course, Google is the most powerful and the biggest. And these days, families no longer buy a set of encyclopedia, you know, to be placed in a house as a source of knowledge. It used to be Encyclopedia Britannica, but these days, I think uh, we don't find families putting the full set, the 24 volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica in their houses, because the information could be quite easily accessible uh, using Google. But also, please remember that both Google and the social media contains information as well as disinformation. And very often, it also contains uh, prejudices. Now, if you tend to be inclined to certain opinions, that is the kind of information that you get from the social media, not the other source of information. And if you are in the United States, you know that some media are really for the Democrats. So you're on the side of the Democrats and uh, you get a lot of news about anti-Republicans uh, and also the president. But on the other hand, if you are on the Republican side, you tend to watch Fox News and you get information just from one side. So uh, we have been given a barrage of information, but uh, there's also a lot of disinformation that we need to be able to sort out what is it for us to believe. Now, the Buddhists, uh, we can get some Buddhist examples of what we mean by learning by discovery. One famous story is a story of Kisa Gotami, uh, who uh, had a son, and that was the first son, who died uh, in childbirth. Okay? Now, uh, Kisa Gotami was uh, struck uh, by the death of a son that she could not accept the death. So she went around asking for people to heal her sick son. That's why she said, my son is sick. Until somebody asked her to, to go to the Buddha because he says, uh, Madam, I'm not able to help you. you. Your son has died. But why don't you go and see the Buddha because he, he, he's a doctor. So when she went to see the Buddha, the Buddha saw that the son was dead. Uh, but instead of telling her directly that the son was dead, uh, the Buddha gave Kisagotami a little experiment, a little field study. And that is uh, to go to the village and just try to find out um, in the village whether there is a household when no one has died. So Kisa Kotami thought that was fairly simple because everybody there in Northern India will cook with mustard. So she went from house to house asking whether you have a mustard seed. And people said, yeah, of course, <laughs> at least help yourself. But she says, no, I cannot take a mustard seed if somebody in this household have died. And uh, from house to house she went, there was no house that she could find where no one has died. So in the evening when she returned to the Buddha, she became very composed and wise. And she says, oh master, I discovered that death is actually universal. I could not find a house where no one has died. And the Buddha says, death, Kisagotama, you have discovered the universality of, of, of death and your son has died. Bury the son and come back and I'll take, show you the way to the deathless. Another one was Sona, the musician, who uh, practiced walking meditation and he walked so much that his fat feet bled. Sona comes from a, 
uh, you know, he came from a very uh, privileged uh, family and therefore he's not used to walking on the barefooted. So the Buddha has given Sona an example of how you tune a lute. So if the tune lute is tuned too loose, it doesn't produce a sound. If the string is too tight, it will burst when you try to strum it. And the lute will sound just right if it's correctly tuned. So Sona, by using the analogy of a lute, was able to practice meditation and be successful. And the third lesson that I should, should mention, the Buddha has many lessons, is the lesson that the Buddha gave to Rahula at Mango Stone in Rajagaha. Now Rahula became a monk at the age of seven. So I guess as a young seven-year-old boy, uh, being in a community of monks, uh, he tends to be a little mischievous and telling jokes and also maybe telling lies. <laughs> so the Buddha must have heard about it from the monk, reported to the Buddha, and he decided to visit Rahula at the mango stone, the, you know, uh, the Buddha himself was, was also at the bamboo grove in Rajagaha. So when the Buddha came to see Rahula, Rahula washed the feet of the master, who is also the father. And after that, there was a little bit of water that is left, left in the water dipper. So the Buddha showed the water dipper to Rahula and said, uh, you know, there's a little water in this water dipper. You know, what do you think? How much water do you think is in this dipper? And Rahula took a look and he says, well, uh, master, uh, there's only a little bit of water left in the dipper. And the Buddha said, aha, uh -huh. for the practitioner who tells a deliberate lie, he's as little as the water in this dipper. And then the Buddha took the water and threw the water out from the dipper. And he says, um, you know, um, what happened to the water? And Rahula says, well, the water has been thrown. And the Buddha told Rahula, aha, uh -huh. for the practitioner who tells deliberate lie, he's like the water that is cast away. And then the Buddha turned the water dipper upside down and said, what do you think of the water dipper? Rahula says the water dipper has been turned upside down. And he says, yes, uh, the practitioner who tells a deliberate lie and who has no shame telling a deliberate lie is empty and hollow like the water dipper. And he says, Rahula, what do you think of a mirror? What is a mirror used for? And Rahula told the Buddha that it is for reflection. And the Buddha says, uh, Rahula, similarly, that's what we need to do. Before, during, and after performing an action, both by body, speech, and mind, we should reflect whether that action will bring happiness or unhappiness to ourselves, to others, and both to ourselves and others. So this is the case where the Buddha used analogy in order to teach Rahula. And this is the way teachers need to teach in order that the students will have discovery for themselves, not just giving them things to remember. And sometimes these days students even object to that and they actually rebel against that. Uh, by giving good examples like that, uh, it is the way that people can actually discover from their own experience. Now, the role of Buddhist education is for a holistic transformation of humanity through ethical, intellectual, and spiritual training. So education must involve both the ethical part, the intellectual part, and spiritual part for the training to be complete, for it to be holistic. And when we talk about the all-round development of a child, it will include his physical development, his mental development, his moral, as well as intellectual attributes. And this is uh, through this training, a person becomes wise, he becomes intelligent, he becomes a good moral character that is trusted and honored by people. He's not violent, very kind, very compassionate, and as well as logical and free from superstition. So he's able to distinguish what is just mere beliefs and superstition, or what these days we say fake news, and what is actually logical. He checks facts, and he behaves wisely, intelligently, and compassionately. And of course, the ultimate goal in Buddhism is for a person to gain spiritual, emotional, and intellectual freedom. And this is the attainment of Nibbana. In Buddhism, we have the highest regards for wisdom because of all miracles, uh, the Buddha mentioned that the miracles of education is best. And that was a case in Nalanda, uh, the site later on of the Nalanda University, which was built on the site. And the Buddha happened to be at Nalanda. And there was a monk by the name of Kivata, 
who came to the Buddha and asked the Buddha to show to the people of Nalanda some miraculous powers because apparently there has been some contest in Nalanda. Uh, various people have been showing that they have uh, some magical powers. And the Buddha mentioned to Kevata that there are certain people can produce uh, med, uh, this um, acts, you know, uh, you know, the acts of a magician to make things appear and disappear. There is also the, another miracle of being able to read the minds of people. Uh, but the Buddha mentioned to Kevata that the greatest of all miracles is the miracle of education. If a person in the past has been performing bad actions, harmful actions, and because of learning the Dharma, they actually become good, they become transformed. That itself is a miracle, and that's what we call the miracle of education. And the Buddhism has given the highest regards to wisdom, or called Panya, because through Panya, it will give us the, the very sharp uh, knife in order to cut through impurities, right? The power of Panya. And uh, the core of the Buddha's teachings, uh, this was actually taught in the very first sermon that he gave to the five monks the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta, where the Buddha mentioned about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. And the Eightfold Path is a path of transformation on how we can bring a transformation to ourselves by following, the, by practicing the eight factors. And when we group them, you have the factors of morality, which is called Sila, uh, the factors of mental culture, of meditation, which is called Samadhi, and the factors of wisdom, which is called Panya. And uh, these uh, Sila Samadhi Panya is contained within the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, the Noble Eightfold Path has also sometimes been categorized as the path of vision, which is called a Samadhi, that is having a perfect vision of what the vision of enlightenment. And the seven uh, remaining factors will be the path of transformation. Uh, how we go about transforming ourselves so that eventually we can gain enlightenment. Now, there are several routes of acquiring knowledge, uh, which is called jnana. Uh, we can acquire knowledge by the accumulation of learning or teaching. And the three roads to gather knowledge and wisdom. First will be sutta manya jnana, that is knowledge acquired by learning. And this is the knowledge that we get uh, that is taught in schools. Yeah? The things that we read in books, things that we get from our teachers, things that we, we learned, the sutta manya jnana. The second source of knowledge will be Chinta Maya Jnana. This is the knowledge gained by thinking, by reasoning, by reflecting. And the third source of knowledge is called Bhavana Maya Jnana. This is the knowledge acquired through meditation. And this is the experiential realizations and insight knowledges that arises through mental cultivation. When the mind becomes very calm, peaceful, and pure, and when it goes very deep into uh, meditation, certain types of aspira uh, realizations will arise naturally within ourselves. It is not something that we read from books or that we hear from teacher. It's something that we discover from ourselves. And this suddenly begin to open, uh, you know, a certain misunderstandings and conceptions that we have about things. And it opens our eye to see things as they truly are. And this is what we call the bhavana maya jnana or bhavana jnana, maya panya the knowledge that is acquired through meditation. In teaching, we try to extend the teaching method from Sutta Maya Jnana, that is just giving teaching, to include also Chinta Maya Jnana, so that the students can gather knowledge from reflection as well as discovery. So this is the new way that we teach right now, instead of just giving lectures, giving various types of assignments that through going through these assignments, the students will learn and discover for themselves. And I've given some examples of how the Buddha encouraged people to discover the truth by giving them some experiments or giving them some analogies. With regards to learning, uh, the term, the Pali word, the sutta, means learning. And this is, of course, the first step in order to acquire knowledge. Uh, there is also another term called sipa, which means knowledge or skills uh, acquired in skills or in crafts or arts. And these are uh, denotes worldly knowledge. In the Mangala Sutta, one of the sutras taught by the Buddha, there is a verse that says, Bahu Satsancha Sipancha Vinayocha Susekito. So we see the word Sipancha comes from the word Sipa. It means, uh, this verse means vast learning, perfect handicraft, 
and a highly trained uh, uh, discipline. Here, the Buddha enumerated 38 blessings that a person gets. Huh? Uh, and the Sikha is higher training. And there are three types of higher training. You've got Sila Sikha, the higher training of morality, Samadhi Sikha, higher training of mental cultivation, and Panya Sikha, higher training of wisdom. And as Buddhists, we observe the five precepts, the Pancha Sila. The Pancha Sila, or the five precepts, are training rules. They are see as part of the Sila Sikha. They are not commandments given by the Buddha, but they are training rules so that we become a more moral and, uh, and, and not a harmful character. Yeah? That is part of our, uh, as a practice for, for lay, lay people. Now, in terms of stages of learning, there are three stages of learning. There is what you call the pariyati, that is learning. And from learning, you have to put that into practice. That's called patipati, that is practicing, and patibeta, that's realization. So learning, practice, realization. Pariyati, paripati, patibeta. And of course, there is a big difference between knowing and actually doing. Uh, knowing is what we call declarative learning. That is learning by reading and, and uh, uh, listening. We can learn, you know, we can read about how to be compassionate, but it doesn't make us compassionate. We have to move on to the next stage, which is called procedural learning. That is learning to cultivation and practice. And for an effective learning, it has to incorporate both. Neuroscience teaches us that these kinds of learning operates uh, through totally different brain circuits. So when we uh, learn, uh, you know, by reading and learning, one part of the brain is uh, the circuit is activated. And when we begin to put that into practice, when we try to cultivate and practice it out, another circuit of the brain, another circuit is activated. So we need both uh, forms of learning for, for there to be transformation, yeah? for us to be completely, uh, this is, this is uh, validated from neuroscience itself. So we, had, we need both pariyati, patipati, and patipeda. Now, um, I must also mention that there are challenges of well-being. Now, um, the problem of these days that students face is, number one, distractibility. And in fact, uh, this is what we call attention deficit disorder among children. It is actually very serious because these days, uh, am, I, am I okay uh, in terms of my internet? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Little, disru little disruption, yes, that's okay. Yes. Okay, all right. Uh, now, uh, uh, this it's going, day, well. it's going children, on very well. We are learning a lot. Okay. Children are bombarded with so much information, so many things, with their iPad, with their phones and all that. And so children have problems of keeping their attention. So they have what we call the attention deficit disorder. And this is called distractibility. And uh, in fact, uh, there is a scholastic paper uh, that says a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. They have tried to connect um, people whose minds are distracted and connect that with the feeling of unhappiness. So a mind that is composed is a mind that is linked up with happiness. So you can see that because of this distractibility, it becomes a serious problem among children because they become very, very unhappy. The mind jumps all over the place and the children becomes really unhappy because of the connection between a wandering mind and an unhappy mind. The second problem is what the problem of loneliness. Despite the fact of people being connected with the social media, people feel isolated. And this is the case of uh, children having, uh, you know, like Facebook, uh, Instagram, and they put very happy pictures about themselves. Actually, sometimes when the, when the people are, uh, when they feel lonely, isolated, and depressed, uh, they tend to put happy pictures of themselves in the social media. So if you follow the Facebook of your friends and you see all of them having such a great time, and you begin, now, what's wrong with myself? You know, so there is a this sense of loneliness. The third problem is negative self-talk and depression. And uh, through research, it has found that there is a large increase of depression amongst children ages 12 to 17 years old. And uh, amongst the negative self-talk and depression, it tends to occur more frequently among the females and males. And it culminates in suicide. So suicide rates have been increasing and it is linked up with negative self-talk and depression. People talking 
about themselves within their minds, talking, running themselves down, you know, criticizing themselves. And this leads to depression. And then finally, the loss of meaning and purpose in life. And again, the people begin to feel that what is the point of me, you know, what is the point of life? And what, what is the purpose of life? And especially, uh, this occurs when people tend to be senior, when their children have already started working and they feel left home, left at home with a couple. And especially if one partner has passed away, they begin to feel very depressed and they lose a sense of purpose. And in fact, it was found that people who had lost a meaning and the purpose in life, uh, the, the um, probability of them dying within the next five years is two times higher than a person who is obese. Okay, so actually losing a sense uh, of uh, losing a purpose in life uh, it has, problem, has a problem with, with health. That's a, all right. Now, neuroscience uh, shows the efficacy of meditation and mindfulness practices. Mindfulness and meditation training can help to rewire the brain through a process of what we call neuroplasticity. Neuro relates to the brain and our nervous system. Plasticity comes from the Greek word that is moldable, that we can shape it. So neuroplasticity means the brain itself will reshape itself uh, through mindfulness and meditation. And in fact, uh, there have been uh, many uh, research that is done in, in uh, good universities. For instance, they use an MRI scanner on a randomized group. That is, this group of people have been chosen randomly. And they put them to compassionate training for two weeks. And they have to practice meditation for 30 minutes per day. So 30 minutes times 14 days, that's about seven hours of meditation within that two weeks. And when they scan the people who have gone through this um, compassionate training, they found that in the brain itself, the neural linkage between the prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain, and the ventral striatum of the brain becomes stronger. And these two parts of the brain, when it is linked, uh, when it is strongly connected, shows uh, the correlation with positive emotion. So in other, in other words, these uh, people who underwent compassionate training, meditation for two weeks, 30 minutes per day, have actually developed the, the link of their brains is strengthening positive emotions. And this comes from Wing et al. in Psychological Science, uh, published in 2013. So in effect, we could actually show, science can actually show, as you can show the, the diagram, the, uh, the diagram of our, our brains, that meditation can address the negative emotions that I mentioned earlier, the four factors that work against uh, our well-being. And we can actually address it through meditation because through meditation, the, the process of neuroplasticity, it will strengthen the connection of positive emotions within ourselves. Now, let me just move on to the adoption of Buddhist practice in schools as well as in the West. And the source is from Mindful Schools of. Oh. Now, mindfulness that has long been practiced in the East as a spiritual tradition for personal improvement and self-transformation has now made its way into schools in the West. Educators, and uh, not only in the West, it is now coming back to the East. For instance, in, at Taylor's University where I teach, we have somebody who teaches uh, mindfulness training also in our university. Because educators and educational institutions have started to introduce mindfulness training in schools because it has been empirically shown to bring tangible benefits. It is shown that by practicing mindfulness, students become more successful learners and they become more connected with the members of the education community. And this has been validated by scientific research. Now, some of the benefits from mindfulness. Number one, it brings in improve attention. Earlier, we mentioned about the problem of distractibility here. Yeah? Uh, so uh, mindfulness improves attention. And there are many studies to this, to say that after going through training in mindfulness, attention improves and the concentration span also improves. Number two, 
better emotional regulation. Mindfulness actually changes the structure of the brain, the wiring of the brain, uh, to show that uh, the brain becomes, a person becomes less reactive and is able to undertake tasks even when, even when they have been provoked. So in a sense, a person becomes much more balanced, becomes much more calm, and uh, during moments of crisis, they can handle situations much better because they have undergone mindfulness training. The third thing that they discover is to people who have gone through training shows greater compassion. And this is taking people randomly selected, put them through mindfulness training, and it is shown that they are more ready to help someone in need and they have greater self-compassion. And what they discover is that this is the part of the brain just, just uh, above the ear. That is the part of the brain that has been activated that's connected with empathy and compassion. And also, it shows a reduction of stress and anxiety. And it shows that mindfulness training reduces stress. A person becomes less anxious when placed in a stressful uh, situation. And this is because a certain part of the brain called amygdala, that part of the brain uh, is actually uh, being very much controlled. That is the part of the brain that brings up stress. Uh, the other interesting finding is that by putting people to this uh, compassion training or mindfulness training for something like uh, eight weeks, right? And they measure the brain of people in the 50 years old, compare that to the brains of people who are 25 years old and found that the amount of gray matter among these two group of people is the same. Whereas, if you compare the brains of people in the 25 years old with a control group, that is people who do not go through uh, training, mindfulness training or meditation, uh, in the 50 years age group, you could see the gray matter of the brain actually much decline. So as you get older, the brain matter gets decreased and therefore the person becomes less, uh, you know, he loses his memory. But for a person who practices meditation, there seem to be not much difference between people who are 25 years old and people who are 50 years old. In, in other words, mindfulness training and meditation makes the mind younger, makes the brain younger, which is interesting. Okay, so this is the, uh, the brain, and you could see that mindfulness develops the brain. This is the amygdala, number one. Huh? Uh, this is the part that, that is linked up with stress. So when you do mindfulness training, this part becomes less activated, and so you become calmer, and you do become less panicked. <laughs> you are able to handle uh, much better. Second part is called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is critical to learning and memory. So through meditation, this is the part that is actually developed. And so uh, the gray matter density also increases. And a person, it also controls the amygdala. So a person becomes better controlled and less stressful. And the third part is what we call the pre prefrontal cortex. This is associated with maturity, including regulation of emotions and behavior and ability to make wise decisions. So this is the part that is activated during mindfulness training. And this is the part that keeps a, a, a senior person, his mind young. So the brain matter, the gray matter of this part remains young and high density, equivalent to a person who is 25 years old. Now, um, uh, the educators have found this practice of mindfulness meditation, which is part of our Buddhist tradition, uh, brings benefit for the teachers. They found that the teachers uh, re has reduced stress and less burnt out feelings. They are more efficient in doing their jobs. Uh, they are more, they're emotionally more supportive of the classroom and better, they're able to organize their classrooms better. And what the teachers learn in mindfulness, they also de derive, uh, they also see that the schools, their students actually do well, the students perform well uh, for the teachers that do meditation, okay? Now for the students, students benefit from mindfulness practice as well because they have better learning skills. They have better social emotional skills. So they become less disruptive. The troublemakers become no longer troublemakers and they have a sense of well-being. And these benefits actually carry, they carry with them throughout their life. It is a kind of long-term improvement. That is if they keep on uh, practicing mindfulness training. Eh? And uh, this is among the youths who practice mindfulness training. Number one, attention and learning skills. So they have better attention and focus. They have much better cognitive development. That is, they can learn better. The second aspect that they develop is their social and emotional skills. They have better behavior skills. They have empathy. That is, they can 
empathize with people who are uh, in an unfortunate situation and they have uh, perspective taking, they can see things from a bigger perspective and they have also improved social skills. Therefore, they relate with you in a much nicer way, speak well, carry themselves well. And the third thing that they develop is what we call resilience. And this is during times of stress, uh, they have better emotional regulation, reduced anxiety and stress. And for post-traumatic symptoms, that is for people who are in deep stress, they have much less. And they also uh, no depression, control of depression. And uh, very interestingly, in the year 2020, this year, uh, let me just minimize this so you can actually see what's on the screen. The American Heart Society came up with this poster. It is, they are trying to promote loving kindness meditation or metta. Very interestingly, in Malaysia, I have been conducting metta on a weekly basis, I think now for 22 years. <laughs> now, the American Heart Society has taken this uh, metta meditation, uh, which is being practiced by Buddhists, and actually reproduce this, encouraging people to practice metta, sending loving kindness to themselves, sending to their family members. Uh, sending to someone who is neutral, sending to someone who is difficult, sending to groups and sending to everyone in the world. Uh, uh, this is the ideal part that you send to everybody, but actually for a person starting with matter, we, we uh, just hold on the practice of sending let me come to, to your enemies and somebody difficult because this is not so easy. So we practice actually sending to yourself, family members, uh, sending to everyone, sending to groups, okay? This meditation is being, this uh, Buddhist method, and um, the American Heart Society discovered that by practicing metta, by uh, encouraging people to practice metta, it can develop empathy and the feelings of connection while reducing bias, anger, depression, and anxiety. And this metta, practice of metta, is actually good for the heart. That is why the American Heart Society is promoting the practice of matter for Americans. Isn't it interesting? <laughs> the practice of matter meditation, 2020, was being promoted by the American Heart Society for Americans. And this is something that has been practiced for, uh, for 2,500 years by Buddhists. <laughs> and of course, scientific studies now support the wide acceptance of mindfulness and meditation. Uh, this is something that came from, from the East came from India, came from, and has now gone to the West and also learning institution. And, but the good thing about the West is that they do things, they validate things by doing scientific studies. And the scientific studies uh, shows that mindfulness training and meditation is actually effective. It is not just something for yogis and, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, they think that these are all the people who go to the Himalayas and all that. It's got nothing to do with us. Now, the studies show that actually it has something very much to do with them, right? Mindfulness training and meditation. Buddhists know that these practices referred in our Noble Eightfold Path, right effort, sama, vayama, right mindfulness, sama, sati, and right mind meditation, sama, samadhi. These are the factors on the Noble Eightfold Path. This is part of our mind training. Huh? When these practices, well, these practices in the West are not part of spiritual training. Unlike the Buddhists, this is not considered to be spiritual training. But nevertheless, when the Western people practice meditation and mindfulness, they will see that their mental and emotional processes will be refined. They become refined, right? And after the mental training, the practitioners are more inclined to act in accordance with sila because the mind becomes peaceful. So in the East, we start from sila, samadhi, panya. In the West, they start from samadhi, and then they go to sila, <laughs> the other way around. But it's still good. It's still good. All right. So this is to show that Western uh, the scientific studies support the wide, wide acceptance of mindfulness training and meditation. Uh, with that, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you. <laughs>